And now, the founder and president of Emerson Collective, Laureen Powell Jobs. Our country and the world are in the midst of a pandemic. Here at home, this crisis has laid bare the systemic injustices that have long been ignored. We are also experiencing a moral crisis rooted in our failure to treat one another with the dignity and respect every human life deserves. Joining us now is someone who is addressing that moral crisis by building a movement to engage and mobilize 140 million poor and low income Americans through his organizations, Repairs of the Breach and the Poor People's Campaign. Welcome Reverend Barber, thank you for joining us. As a student of history, you know this, there are periods in American history when we've made large profound leaps forward. These shifts have come out of our darkest periods as a nation, but we regroup, we regather, we renew the promise and then create something far beyond. In the words of prison abolitionist scholar, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, what the world will become already exists in fragments and pieces, experiments and possibilities. As a leader, you see those fragments and possibilities and you translate that. You translate them to all of us so that we can see them too. Through the Poor People's Campaign, you envision and advocate for a much more equal and just society. So I'm hoping we can start this conversation as you describe to everyone listening the pillars of that campaign and how you are building a movement that will become a profound leap forward. First of all, thank you so much. And in the words of the campaign, forward together and not one step back. Some years ago, Repairers of the Breach, which is uh, one of the co-organizers um, of the Poor People's Campaign, uh, looked at where we are in this culture. And we started talking about five interlocking injustices, five that yes. are hurting us as a nation. Uh, we decided we had to step outside of the left versus right, the liberal versus conservative puny categories. And when we look at our deepest moral values, and I'll talk about a little bit about where those values come from later, there mm -hmm. are five interlocking injustices that are literally trying to strangle the life and stop out of and stop the heart of this democracy systemic racism and by that we mean racism in all of its ugly policy forms uh voter suppression mass incarceration police brutality and killing of innocent black bodies um resegregation of our public schools uh but we also mean uh redlining and not allowing resources and loans to come into black communities for economic uplift but we also mean the denial of justice for our immigrant brothers and sisters, particularly our Latino brothers and sisters. We also mean the continuing mistreatment of our First Nation brothers and sisters. That's systemic racism. And then systemic poverty. Before COVID, 140 million people living in poverty and low wealth in this country, 62 million people working every day without a living wage, many living in their cars. Before COVID, um, 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 we had mi uh, um, um, millions of people, 87 million people uninsured or underinsured before COVID, before COVID, 61% of all African-Americans poor and low wealth, uh, 40, 60 million white people poor and low wealth, 26 million poor and low wealth white people, 68, 69% of all Latinos and native people, indigenous people poor and low wealth before COVID. After COVID, we, we were at 43% of the nation poor and low wealth. After COVID, it's upwards of 50% and growing. And then the mm. third pillar is that we must address ecological devastation. We, uh, before COVID, 4 million families could get up every morning and buy unleaded gas and could not buy unleaded water. 
before COVID. The highest mm -hmm. per capita death rate was in can uh, Cancer Alley uh, uh, down in Louisiana before COVID. And then the fourth issue is addressing the war economy before COVID. We were spending 54 cents of every discretionary dollar into the war economy and less than 16 cents of every discretionary dollar into healthcare and infrastructure and educating and funding community health centers and so forth and so on. And then finally, we must challenge the, the what we call the immoral, uh, distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism, religious nationalism that suggests that all that matters is that you bow to whoever's in power at a particular time, that you're against gay people, that you're against the woman's right to choose, that you're for prayer in the school, for gun rights, and, 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 and for a particular party, uh, most of the time described as Republican Party. These five interlocking injustices, we believe in this campaign, must be addressed, challenged, because they all connect in ways to destroy and undermine the lives of poor and low wealth people, and then ultimately of the very lifeblood of this democracy. Yes. So as you speak about these interlocking injustices and inequities, you often talk about the need for moral fusion and, and you hearken back to reconstruction and the civil rights movement as you describe that. Can you talk a little bit about the moral fusion that's required to address these deep systemic inequities? Well, you know, when we talk about morality and, and when I talk about it as a public theologian who focuses on public policy, I'm never talking about just what feels good. We're talking about what is right as right is understood uh, from our deepest religious values and our deepest constitutional values. A moral movement suggests that there are some things that are not about left and right, Democrat, Republican, but right and wrong. Uh, and there's some things, if it's a moral issue, it's not an option of whether or not you're going to to uh, fight for it. If, if it's not, it's, 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 it's of life importance. It's a moral imperative. It's a theological necessity. Uh, it's what my grandmama called an eternal have to. When you say something is a moral issue, you're saying that I, my life doesn't even make sense unless unless I'm on the side of that. Now, this is not new. The abolition, the, the movement to fight the genocide of indigenous people was a moral issue. The abolition movement were, were moral issues. The early women's suffrage movement, moral issues. The early um, fight to provide labor rights and fundamental minimum wages were moral issues. Uh, the, the civil rights movement were, was a moral movement. Uh, and what those, all of those movements said was basically this. When we look at the state of public policy, uh, and examine that public policy over against mm -hmm. the, the moral traditions, like in the Hebrew Bible where it says in Isaiah 10, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor and women of their children of their rights. Or when Jesus said that a nation would be judged by how it treats the least of these. Or if you're not particularly religious, you look at the Declaration of Independence that says that any time there has been a long train of abuses against life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the people have a right to alter. In fact, they're called to alter that government. Or you look at the Constitution itself, those moral principles, that every public piece of public policy should establish justice. It should provide for the common defense. It should promote the general welfare. Uh, it should ensure domestic tranquility and not division. Uh, we should have equal protection under law, equal protection under the law. Yeah. Voting rights should be protected in a way that uh, no one can deny or breathe. So those then become moral issues. They're not about party. They're about a principle. Mm -hmm. And what we mean by moral issues, Laureen, is this. Every piece of public policy, we should do what we call a moral analysis. Does it line up? with our deepest moral values. I often say to politicians, if you put your hand on the Bible and swear to uphold uh, the Constitution, you ought to know at least what's in yeah. both of them. What's in the Bible, what's in the Constitution. <laughs> but not only must there be a moral analysis, Laureen, there must be a moral uh, 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 articulation of why these 
why why poverty is immoral and why it is economically insane and constitutionally inconsistent. And, but there also must be moral attachment. In other words, helping people to understand that that the, the issues of poverty and race connect. In fact, oftentimes the same forces that will engage in racism are also the same forces that deny living wages. So we want people to see how adversarially people are connected, but also how when we come together to fight for a more just society and we face all of these issues, we are strong together. And then lastly, we need what we call moral action. And that means yeah. you're, that when it comes to fighting for these issues, like living wages, like health care, like against um, uh, uh, voter suppression, against police brutality, we are going to use every moral nonviolent tool at our disposal, every one of them. Sometimes it'll mean going to jail. Sometimes it'll mean marching in the street. Sometimes it'll be using that nonviolent weapon of voting. But the, but when it's a moral issue, what we're saying is there can never be backing up. There can never be a turning around. We must always fight for against systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and this false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And you have stated that our our poor and low income american brethren are often not engaged in civic life and often don't use that powerful tool of the vote mm -hmm. and so talk a little bit about some of the practical measures that that you have in order to enfranchise as many people as possible in this in this civic activity well, two things happen. Oftentimes, politicians don't even try to engage poor people. And that's low wealth people, which is a great trap. Republicans tend to racialize poverty. Democrats have tended to run from poverty. People get stuck in a neoliberalism mindset that says either you got trickled down from the top or you've got just the middle class. If they lift, you pull everybody. When the fact of the matter is, as someone once said, if a boat is stuck at the bottom, even a rising tide is not going to lift it up. Somebody has to get it unstuck from the mud. And so the reality is for too long, you think about it. If you look, if you think about every um, presidential debate we have had just since 2016, there had been one hour focused on the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, over 50% mm -hmm. of our children, even before COVID. And even during COVID, you don't hear a lot about poor and low wealth people from a policy perspective. We're beginning to hear some of it, but we haven't had one presidential debate. Think about that. 43% of the nation facing something and not one national debate that commits at least an hour to address these issues. So what we're saying is, first of all, it's a failure of our politics to think you can ignore 43% of the nation. But more than just a moral failure, we now know it's an electoral failure. We just did a study called Unleashing the Power of Poor and low wealth Voters with a professor from Columbia University. We already knew that the same states that were racist voter suppression states were also uh, states that um, were high poverty states, that racist voter suppression states also elected people who then put laws more on the side of racist uh, uh, police than they did on the side of the people. We knew that. But what we didn't know until this study came out is that poor and low wealth people now represent Lorraine, nearly a third of the electorate today, nearly a third. What we did not know is that in 15 states, from Michigan to New Mexico, to, 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 to Mississippi, to North Carolina, uh, to Wisconsin, even poor and low wealth people voted between one and 19% higher than they voted in 2016, they could fundamentally shift the outcome of every gubernatorial race, every Senate race, and the presidential race. They could they could change the margin of victory. Not not twenty one percent, just nineteen percent. And the highest is nineteen those are in, in the small numbers. Line. Yeah, those are small numbers. It's one percent in Michigan. It's it's hmm. it's, it's under ten percent in Mississippi. It's it's nineteen percent in North Carolina. Then we found out that there are sixty three million poor and low wealth people who did not vote. We found out in the three states that Donald Trump won by 80,000 votes that gave him uh, the Electoral College, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, 
there were 2.1 million poor and low wealth people that did not vote. We found out that of the 63 million poor and low wealth people that did not vote, 34 million didn't vote, 29 million did vote. Now, here's the last thing we found out, which is why we're now doing something called Voting is Power Unleashed. And I would encourage people to go to www.poorpeoplecampaign.org and click on how you can be involved in in, in in calling and polling and pushing and reaching out to people and encouraging people to get out to vote. Um, we found out that that uh, um, um, of those uh, 29 million voted, voted. we yeah. asked the question, why don't you vote? Now, this is what we found out. Of those persons making less than $50,000, they vote overwhelmingly for progressives. They don't vote for extremists, but the volume is low. So we asked, well, why don't you vote? The first issue was, politicians don't talk to us. They don't talk to us. They don't talk about, so poor and low wealth people are not just apathetic. What they were saying is they don't even they talk don't, to us. They don't, they don't hear anything. it in the political discourse. Right. Exactly right. That was the first issue. The second issue was, well, they're not actually in order. The next issue was transportation and day off, time off. Because if you have a situation where election is a day, a lot of poor and low wealth people can't afford to get off work. They can't get off, right? A lot don't have transportation. The third issue was voter suppression. Now, we could correct all three of those. We can correct all three of those. We surely can correct the first one, and that is talking to them. We, we Lastly, we did this in Kentucky last year. Uh, there was a, a candidate, Democrat, Republican, the Republican governor had taken away health care, so forth and so on. We went into Kentucky with our friends and we organized in the, what we call from the holler to the hood. And in five counties that were Trump counties, by going in talking to people and saying, well, if the politicians aren't talking to you, then make them listen to you by voting. Do you know they turned three of those counties? They are that from being so-called red to, to progressive county or the blue counties, however you want to describe it. And, that, and the governor unseated an incumbent when poor and low wealth people were engaged around issues and they never endorsed, we never as a group, as an organization endorsed the candidate, we endorsed issues. And then the night that, mm -hmm. and he started running on issues and people turned out from the hood to the holler, that can happen all over the country. And especially mm -hmm. last thing, that's to happen in the South because when we complain about the fact in this country, that the people who are choosing our Supreme Court justices come from the least populated state, that's the negative. Here's the positive. Those least populated states are also high poverty states and unorganized states. And in all of those least, high, uh, least populous states, if you organize poor and low wealth people, one to 19% of them and most of them, you could change who sits in the United States in an Alabama and in a Georgia and in a Mississippi and in a Virginia and in a North Carolina, Texas and a New Mexico. And in those 30 states from Maryland to over to New Mexico, that's 193 electoral votes. And it's also 60 members of the United States Senate. Poor and low wealth people are the hope of this country electorally. And it's political suicide not to talk to them. Thank you. Um, I know we're out of time. I always find it enriching to speak to you. There are few leaders who are more effective or visionary uh, than you are, especially in this era of both disorientation and opportunity. Your voice cuts like a hot knife through butter through the cynicism and despair. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the work that you're doing and for being the moral light that we need right now. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for history's sake. Can I say one thing on camera that you can hold on to? I, yeah, for sure. It was in 1857. Mm -hmm. Justice Tan was on the court. He was wrongfully put on the Supreme Court, should have never made it. He presided over the Dred Scott decision that said a black man had no rights than a white person ever had to pay attention to. That black people were not citizens, barely human, if, if at all, therefore could not then had no rights. Two months later, Frederick Douglass was asked, what about this decision? 
And Frederick Douglass on, in May of 1857 said, this is a monstrous decision. And he said he went down, that's how bad it was. But then he did a turn that we must do. We cannot merely mourn from the standpoint of being going in a corner crying. We have to come out of the corner fighting and have the kind of mourning that is deeply concerned. And so Frederick Douglass said, a decision as monstrous of this should be called what it is. I'm paraphrasing. He went on to say, oppression as organized as that against us will seem invincible right up to the moment it falls. Mm. But then he said, there's always another look. He said, David looked invincible until he stood over Goliath. He said, our movement has always looked like it would not work. He said, but the truth of the matter is perhaps this is the final link in the chain to the undoing of the entire system of slavery and uh, oppression. He says, so therefore, we know from history that every attempt to ally and diminish and stop our movement has only served to intensify and embolden our agitation. Today, in 2020, if Frederick Douglass could believe that in 1857, 163 years later, we have no excuse to mourn and cry and act like certain people, i.e. the current president, the current Senate leader, even if they make this decision and wrongfully appoint somebody for, Ru for Rupert, have the finals to say. If Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and white and black abolitionists didn't quit back then, neither yes. can we now. Instead, these actions must only serve to embolden and intensify our moral agitation for justice, love, and a better democracy, a genuine democracy.